Got it. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for November 17, 2022, in accordance with board policy 8311. Chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with the state liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their name before making and seconding a motion, as well as requesting discussion on agenda items. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Is Ms. Cox with us? She, she may have her microphone muted. Ms. Cox? Um, sorry, Mr. Offerman. Present. Ms. Solosky. Present. Ms. Causey. Ms. Hassan. Present. Mr. McMillan. Present. And Ms. Hen is present as well. Yes, present. Please call and note the names of all uh, excuse me, please call on please call the role of the staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas? Present. <laughs> Ms. Shea? Present. Ms. Kraft? Present. Dr. Wolf? Present. Ms. Brooke? Present. And we have additional folks. We have Ms. Barnes. Good. Please call and note the names of all staff, um, all, all staff members participating in the meeting. Request there any other members sitting on the call that you have not named. I know Ms. Hen is here. And we have Ms. Barnes. Okay. Ms. Wise. Present. Ms. Curtis. All right, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Harrington, Mr. Harrington. Present. Mr. Barnett. Present. Ms. Brewer. Present. And I'm going to apologize ahead. Ms. Banaszak. Present. Ms. Tillman. Present. Ms. Walks. Present. And Ms. O'Connell. Uh, present. And I'm not sure if I'm missing anybody else. Ms. Cox, Ms. Barnes was married and goes by Mrs. Metzger now, which might be oh, what she did in the Sorry. Answer. No, that's OK. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> I believe she is here. OK. okay. Uh, and I also have one teacher from my school at Mars and States. Um, uh, Misha Polyansky is also present. OK. Wonderful. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have a presentation on elementary ELA curriculum pilot update. Ms. Shea, Ms. Croft, and Dr. Wolf will uh, will present. I'll turn it over now to, uh, to Dr. McComas. Yeah, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and for any members who this may be their final curriculum committee. We want to thank you for your service and time um, on this particular committee and um, we wish you well in whatever your next chapter may be. And for those of you who will be continuing this journey with us, uh, thank you for joining us today. At this time, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Ms. Shea and Ms. Craft and team. As you can see or and have heard, we have also invited 
with principals who are at the pilot school uh, and there are some teachers implementing the, the program. Um, we are here today pr to provide you an informational update at, at your request uh, to see how we are doing with this uh, elementary reading and writing uh, curriculum. So um, with no further delay, I'll hand it over to Ms. Shea and team. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Corns, are you going to be presenting the PowerPoint or should I pull it up? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. So you can go to the next slide. It's like magic with Mr. Corns. Um, next slide, please. So we wanted to start very briefly because as Dr. McComas said, we are grateful to be joined here from our experts in the field and we want to make sure we save enough time for board members to engage in dialogue with all of them to hear directly from uh, our teachers, our reading specialists, and our administrators leading this work. Um, but I did want to level set, especially because we do have some new folks joining the conversation about why we're even here. Why are we looking for a new ELA curriculum? And so the first is really because of MSDE requirements. So in Comar regulations, it does require that we have an evidence-based curriculum aligned to standards. That language is also in our BCPS board policy 6000 which specifically references that curriculum must align with federal and state academic standards and requirements. Um, I want to stop there for a moment because our current curriculum is actually a BCPS developed curriculum, which uses the Wonders Anthology that was published copyright of 2014. I make that distinction because our BCPS curriculum has not been through the MSDE audit process. We did start down that road with MSDE prior to the pandemic because the Comar regulation requires that you either have an evidence-based curriculum that is certified by a third party or MSDE has certified and evaluated your curriculum as being evidence-based. The Wonders Anthology series that our curriculum is based upon was published in 2014 and does not currently meet standards. So in those external third party um, settings that I described that Comar requires, the current series Wonders does not meet evidence-based standards. So um, those are the two policy and, and legal references of why we need to ensure, of course, that our students and our teachers have access to an evidence-based curriculum, which is currently not the case. The third bullet there also references the Maryland Leeds grant funding. So you know last year we had an opportunity to apply for and secure critically important Leeds grant funding. One of the areas for Leeds grant funding under which the strategy that systems could apply was under the science of reading. Our requirement to apply for funding in the science of reading was that LEAs had to apply for all three focus areas under the science of reading, which included having a high quality content rich instructional material curriculum, as well as having screening measures and professional learning. So we, when we applied for the LEADS grant funding, our goal was to flood our schools with that high quality letters professional learning that we know has been critical for our schools to make sure that our teachers have that science of reading knowledge for serving our youngest students. We also currently have Dibbles as our evidence-based screener. And we uh, informed the state at the time of our application that we were moving towards piloting an evidence-based curriculum. So I just wanted to outline sort of our why of those requirements at that state and local level. Next slide. Here's our other reason, and this board knows this all too well. Our achievement is not acceptable. We know that we can and must do better for our students. Our achievement in English language arts has been below acceptable standards and stagnant for many, many years. We see disproportionality in our um, scores along student groups, including students receiving services for ESOL and special education, as well as in our racial student groups. Because of the nature of our BCPS written curriculum, what has happened over time is each year in an effort to be responsive, we do make changes and updates to the curriculum in an effort to address the standards as we understand them, to address changes in our assessments that have happened at the state level over a number of years. And so over the past eight years, and I'm gonna to continue to say eight years because that is an incredibly long time to have a series in place, 
Um, we have made adjustments and changes and additions all in an effort to be responsive to data, but the result of which has been extremely frustrating and challenging for our teachers, especially when we have new teachers or when we have um, long term substitutes. And as you know, right now with our staffing shortages, that is happening more and more in many of our schools. As I mentioned, the Wonders Anthology Series, which is the core text that we use for this curriculum, was copyrighted in 2014. That contract has expired. We have been able to exercise annual renewals um, in order to be able to continue to use that, uh, but that comes at quite a cost, which I'm gonna outline in a moment as well. And so as I mentioned, our efforts with the BCPS homegrown curriculum in which we have added and added and changed and responded in an effort to meet those standard. Um, for many, many years, we have requests from classroom teachers, um, including through our teachers union and other stakeholder groups. Can we please just purchase a cohesive curriculum rather than having this piecemeal approach? Next slide. So that's also a part of our why. And so I started to mention that the current Wonders contract had expired and we do have to then have, uh, we've been exercising renewals ever since uh, 2020 when it first expired. So we're in our second year of exercising a renewal. We can't stay here. So part of the reason we can't stay here, we've already identified is because we are not aligned to evidence-based standards. We can't stay here because our achievement is unacceptable and we know we need to do better for our students. But we also staying here would come at quite a cost. So in order for us to maintain the current access of that curriculum that is not evidence based, we are spending each year close to a million dollars to digitally access those materials for teachers and students. We also would need to purchase wonders materials for Rossville Elementary School. When we opened that brand new school this year, we did not think it was fiscally responsible to purchase a curriculum that was eight years old at the start. And to be frank, I'm not sure we would be able to get all of those materials published since wonders has a newer version, which by the way is very different. So I'll come back to that. We also would need funding to continue to support our writing curriculum. Part of our efforts to purchase a cohesive and comprehensive curriculum is also because our writing curriculum needs additional resources. And our current BCPS curriculum, while we rely on wonders as our core anthology in an effort to have connections to content areas as required by the standards, including in science and social studies and health, uh, we do currently use digital texts that would need to be replaced because they are no longer available. We've been able to do our best this summer to um, identify resources to help our teachers, but that would not be sustainable. Um, so I just wanted to set that reality that part of our why is that fiscally it would be significantly expensive to maintain the current curriculum with the current resources in wonders and those digital pieces. Next slide please. And so my last uh, kind of level setting about why we need a new EL curriculum is going back to that idea of the science of reading. So many of you are familiar with me. Some of you may still see evidence of the pipe cleaners in the boardroom uh, when I did that many years ago. Um, I've already promised for any new board members watching that we will bring the pipe cleaners back out uh, when you have your first meeting because it's a really great way to help demonstrate the complexity of the science of reading. And so we as a system have been very committed to aligning our practices to the science of reading. The more we learn, the more we implement in our classroom and we have made great strides. This image called Scarborough's Rope talks about the two main areas of reading, which are language comprehension and word recognition. I'm gonna start at the bottom with word recognition because this is what many of us think of when we think about learning to read. And at our last curriculum committee meeting, we were able to share some really promising data that we were seeing in our Dibbles screener. That Dibbles screener in the Ready to Read Act measures these skills in word recognition, including phonological awareness, decoding and spelling, and sight recognition. And as you develop proficient readers, the goal is to explicitly and systematically teach these skills and word recognition so that over time our readers become increasingly automatic. 
We do that through our Open Court Reading Foundational Skills Curriculum. Our board supported us a number of years ago with purchasing and adopting Open Court in every single classroom for every child every day in grades K through three. As we shared at length at our last curriculum committee meeting, we are starting to see the results of those efforts. We have promising data in our Dibble screening that our work and our efforts to have a high quality evidence based curriculum in foundational skills are beginning to yield changes in outcomes for our students that we're really excited about. The top of Scarborough's rope represents the other areas of skilled reading, and that is in language comprehension. That addresses content in building background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. This is when we have our students read complex stories in fiction and nonfiction. They work on strategies for developing written responses. Over time, we want to explicitly and systematically teach language comprehension as part of that science of reading, and we want our skilled readers to become increasingly strategic. So while they're becoming increasingly automatic, they're becoming increasingly strategic so that ultimately they get to that goal of skilled reading. Our purpose in developing skilled readers is then so they can go on and experience high levels of literacy across all of our content areas in our elementary grades, middle school, and of course high school and beyond in college and career. The language comprehension portion of our reading curriculum is what is currently addressed in the BCPS curriculum using the Wonders Anthology. That is what we are seeking to replace with the My View Literacy. And it's really important to understand that both are a part of the science of reading. The science of reading includes systematic and explicit instruction and in foundational skills, and we're on it. We're doing a really good job. It also expects in the science of reading explicit and systematic instruction in language comprehension. Knowledge matters and we have to build those skills for our students to become increasingly strategic readers and writers and that is what my view literacy is helping us to pilot. So now I'm going to turn it over to my team in ELA. They're going to talk a little bit more specifically about my view before we get to the good stuff which is all of our partners from schools telling us about how it's going with our students. Dr. Wolf. I think I send it to Pam next, right? It is, but it's actually going to be Allison this time. OK, Allison, I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. That's no, broke. that's good. All right. Um, next slide, please. All right, so for all of those reasons that Ms. Uh, Shea just shared, we initiated that RFI process, which as you can see from the graphic here, um, it's been a two year process uh, almost to get us where we are today. So the RFI was released in December of 2020 and you can see the criteria there. So it had to be a core program. It needed to have a K to five scope and sequence or a K to three five. There had to be again, as Ms. Shea mentioned, that third party validation of a research base. Um, had to be aligned to our Maryland College and Career Ready standards uh, with correlation provided. We know that digital materials were essential as well as scaffolds for our L's and professional development for our teachers provided by the vendor. From that RFI, we received 15 submissions. Uh, that initial review took place in early 2021 and those criteria from part one of the RFI were used to um, to decide whom would move forward or which programs would move forward to stakeholder review. So that stakeholder review committee uh, was convened and it included teachers, reading specialists, special educators, school administrators, uh, representatives from TABCO, as well as central office staff from ELA and also Title I, special education, ESOL, advanced academics, science and social studies. Then in September 2021, um, programs move forward to um, vendor presentation. Uh, that was another review committee that included school administrators, central office staff from CNI, as well as community partners, parents, reading specialists, again, resource teachers, staff development teachers, and incredibly importantly, our classroom teachers. Then finally, in October of 2021, the full body of feedback from stakeholder review was considered and the decision was made to move forward with piloting my view literacy in grades K through five. Next slide, please. So while the specifics of the procurement records within each phase of that 6002 process are confidential information, such as which products were submitted and reviewed or the specific evaluations for them, we do endeavor to be as transparent as possible while operating um, within the guidelines set out in policy and rule. 
So as you can see here, 15 products were submitted and reviewed. During phase one, five products were removed from consideration for not meeting the criteria of being a core instructional program. One program was removed from consideration for not being able to be implemented with Open Court. And as Ms. Shea just underscored, um, we know Open Court was not going anywhere because um, we're seeing that success. Of the remaining submissions, those that scored an average of greater than 10 out of 14 and had that critical supporting third party um, research base were moved forward to that larger stakeholder review. Then in phase two, those five programs moved forward and were reviewed in grade level bands. So K1, 2, 3, and 4, 5. One program was removed from consideration because the texts were not available digitally, which we know is essential for our virtual learning program and the lessons we learned during the pandemic. So from there, the three highest scoring programs move forward to vendor presentations. So in com um, upon completion of the vendor presentations in phase three, this, that stakeholder, stakeholder committee was asked to rate each program in four areas, the student experience, the teacher experience, the parent experience, as well as an overall rating. Next slide, please. So in addition to providing those numerical ratings um, that I just outlined, Committee members were also asked to provide overall commendations, concerns or questions, as well as any additional comments about um, the presentations they received. So in reviewing this feedback, several concerns arose. Committee members expressed concern, concerns about the authenticity of representation in one program and the rigor and alignment in another. And you can see a sampling of that feedback on this slide. Um, additionally, the desire for one consistent program across grades K through five was shared by many. After careful review of the feedback collected from stakeholders throughout the selection process, these two programs were removed from consideration. Any program we move forward must be rigorous and aligned. Um, additionally, Superintendent's Rule 6002 specifically states that instructional materials must be representative of the pluralistic nature and diversity of a global society and free of bias, stereotype, discrimination, and prejudice. So since my view literacy um, then moved forward um, to be piloted during the 21-22 um, school year quarter four. Now I'm going to take over. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Allison. Um, the next slide, please. So this slide is a great visual representation of what both Ms. Shea and Ms. Brooks had shared earlier, that that third party external reviewer, Ed Reports, um, at my view meets the criteria and expectation um, in grades K to five, and not only from our stakeholders, but also that outside reviewer. And Ed Reports is an independent nonprofit committed to ensuring that all students have access to high quality instructional materials. Um, you can also see that my view met the criteria of different state reviews, and it's for that specifically the top of Scarborough's work that text, the rigor of the standards, text complexity, the quality, and building that knowledge, the background knowledge, vocabulary, um, and usability for teachers. Next slide, please. Um, so then because of the pilot, we there's two main reasons basically to partake in a pilot for a school. The one is we need to decide if we want to even use these materials, selection of materials. We had already been through that process. We knew that we were we were going forward with a quality product. So the second reason for doing a pilot, it's called a phase two pilot, prepare to launch. And it's also sometimes called an implementation pilot study. And the purpose is to really pilot test in a smaller scale in order to identify what modifications and supports are going to be needed when we implement to a larger scale. We want to answer the question as a district and as a curriculum office, what do we learn to support our teachers and our students? There is no perfect curriculum program out there. We know that we looked at many and we've read the reports. They all have their pros and their cons. What we want to do is make sure we're putting the best in our teachers hands for our student achievement. You will hear through the remaining presentation how we've been really responsive to collecting data and making those supports as we go through this small scale pilot in order to support larger scale implementation. Next slide, please. 
And so I'm going to interject for a moment because I think Dr. Wolf said something that's so important and she's going to walk through our cycle that we use the pilot for. Um, but I wanted to take an opportunity because I come before this committee around a lot of topics and in the last several years we have implemented and adopted new series in multiple contents. We currently have illustrative math in our secondary schools and actually in our advanced five. We've adopted bridges in the last several years. We've adopted open court. We've actually adopted open court twice in my career. Once when I was a resource teacher uh, 15 years ago and then it went away and everybody begged for it to come back. I've brought in spotlight on music. I've brought in a new art curriculum. And what I want to offer is that in every single one of these instances, when we begin a curriculum implementation, there are teachers that love it and there are teachers that hate it and everything in between. All of those teachers are my teachers. All of those teachers are listened to and all of those teachers are respected in their perspective and supported. It doesn't surprise me when we implement something new that we have a wide range of experiences with that adoption. And so I just think it's really important that because of the experience that we've had in curriculum, I don't go into a pilot implementation expecting 100%. I will offer that the decisions you make as a leader when there's 100% agreement are the easy ones. Those don't happen very often. But what I want to make sure I'm very clear about, because sometimes we talk about the phrase, we need to listen to teachers. I am a teacher and I do believe we need to listen to teachers. What I also know is that teacher feedback can run a huge gamut. Teachers are not a monolith. Their experience with students and the needs that they have to serve their community are wide ranging and all of them are important. And so as an office, we use our curriculum implementation pilot to hear directly from teachers. We want to know of the successes they're having and why. We also want to know about the challenges. What's driving them crazy? What's so difficult? What are their students struggling with so that we as an office can respond? And I just wanted to level set that that's entirely predictable and expected and really the reason we do it so that Dr. Wolf can describe how we've used some of that feedback in this pilot to inform some of the work we've done to support teachers. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Thank you, Ms. Shea. And I also, this plan do study act is a model we use in all of our work and specifically for this pilot because we know we want to meet the needs of our teachers and students. Um, a lot of planning, as you can see from what Ms. Shea, Ms. Shea and Ms. Brooks shared earlier has gone in through this whole process. We, it hasn't been a knee jerk decision. There's been a lot of time to look and review materials and to have a lot of input from multiple stakeholders. Um, we've also set up multiple professional development that Ms. Kraft is going to talk with you about in a minute. We continuously meet with our teachers, collect and analyze their feedback and data in order to plan that ongoing professional development, um, and also to implement and to implement and test our resources and processes with the ultimate end user um, to see what else we need to have in place for student achievement, because that's ultimately our goal. For example, we heard teachers say they wanted to see this lesson, the lessons in action with their own students. Um, they see the plan on the page, but what does this really look like? So we've been working with the vendor to bring a consultant in to do demonstration lessons. We've already had two at two different schools and we have more scheduled for December. We've also been fortunate enough for BCP TV to come in and tape those for us so that we can chunk those and that becomes part of our professional learning moving forward and we can meet a larger scale of teachers teaching each grade level. We'll have demonstration lessons for each grade level. Um, another part of the pilot in the beginning, um, we anticipated that teachers might need one page, of, like a page, it's one page, it's multiple pages, but a unit overview to synthesize what are the objectives, what is the materials, what, what will you need to plan each unit of study. So we created a unit overview. After fourth quarter pilot, we had feedback from teachers of what was helpful with that and what they still needed. So we were, we've been able to revise, and that's been a document that we've been able to revise several times and evolved to really um, provide additional resources and support for our teachers in planning, but also locating resources they need. Um, everything's right there on that unit overview that they need to plan um, for the unit. And we will continue to do that as we move forward. Next slide, please.
So I want to talk for a few minutes about the structures we've used to gather feedback along the way. And we've been very fortunate because we were um, allowed the opportunity to pilot in the spring and then again in the fall. And so some of this um, feedback has been cyclical in nature. Um, and so I'm going to really talk about the four big buckets that we've used to gather feedback um, to inform the implementation plan. And so one is our professional learning evaluations. And so what we were able to do after the spring pilot last year, we uh, you know, conducted a survey, we had focus groups, and we um, were able to take all that data and develop a comprehensive professional development learning plan for this school year. And so as we deliver each of those sessions, we are um, then able to get an evaluation of did this learning meet the needs for you in terms of the teaching and learning cycle and implementing the program. And every time that we get feedback, then we are able to make modifications. So for example, uh, we heard that the training that was delivered from Savis was not as useful as when we delivered it ourselves. And so when we set up the second rounds of the um, implementation essentials, we delivered it ourselves as opposed to having the Savis staff come in. And so that's just one example of many of how we have looked at what we projected to do based on what we gathered feedback on and then continue to collect feedback in the moment to say, what do teachers need and does this meet their need? And before we implement um, that particular training, professional learning again, we go in and make modifications based on what is uh, feedback is given to us. And so we were really able to take that implementation essentials that was delivered in August and change it before we delivered again in September. Another uh, source of feedback is when we give out um, surveys which go to teachers, teacher leaders, principals, reading specialists, um, in terms of finding out what's working um, with implementation and what is not working with implementation. So in addition to uh, short response questions, uh, there is also an opportunity for uh, teachers to write in specific areas that they still have challenges with. We then take those challenges and say, how can we best address this challenge? And in a minute, I'm going to share some of those, the feedback with you, because what we do is we tend to put them into buckets and then talk about what is actionable for us. Uh, in the spring, we had focus groups to find out what was working. In fact, um, I'll give you a very tangible example from our focus groups. So we talked about, okay, uh, for the spring pilot, we didn't purchase any of the level tech sets. Um, and so when we were talking to teachers, they were like, oh, I wish that we could have had them and we didn't have to print them out. So then we said to them, do you think that every classroom teacher needs them or do you think we buy one per grade level? The feedback we got was, I think one per grade level would be great. And so we moved forward with that decision based on feedback from the focus groups. We now have focus groups coming up towards the end of this month where we will continue to collect data on how implementation is going. Because what we know is that it's very important to collect data on the implementation pilot, to know what is working, what's not working, what are the barriers, what are the challenges, so that we can address them. Another way that we collect uh, feedback is through school visits and demonstration lessons. And so this is an opportunity for us to go into the classroom. Sometimes we go into the PLCs and we sit shoulder to shoulder with teachers and we hear from them directly. Um, and that's where I've gotten some of uh, the most valuable feedback is sitting with teachers and them telling me what is working and what isn't working, what they want more of, what they want less of. And so we have that opportunity and so we um, have all taken the lead with uh, uh, some of that we've divided up the schools and so that we can be a presence in the schools and provide support as necessary. But that support is twofold. So while we're there giving support, we're also getting support in terms of them giving us feedback on what still needs to be done to make this a successful implementation. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you just a smattering of feedback that we have gotten um, from our latest survey. So this was our fall survey. Um, and so we were able to bucket, and these are just a couple of excerpts. We, we have lot, lots and lots of feedback um, of some of the challenges. So we have lots of successes too. Let me actually start with that. But I wanted to show you some of the challenges that were surfacing and then how we address them. And so when we actually sat down and looked at all the feedback collectively, we said, okay, so we feel like 
like this feedback really fall, falls under change theory. This th this falls under the rigor of the standards. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these for a minute, and then I'm going to get out of the way because we have some amazing principals and teachers and reading specialists here to actually talk firsthand about the implementation of the pilot. So I'm not going to take too long. So when we think about change theory and adult learning, what we know is that there are things that are predictable. And Ms. Shea um, talked about that a little bit when we adopt something new, that there's this cycle of change of having to learn new things um, and that we always fall into a, what we call the implementation dip, right? So, you know, when you start to struggle with um, these are new ways of doing things and adapting to change. Um, even when you have a good quality program, you're going to see that implementation dip. And so some of the um, comments that you can see on the screen is even veteran teachers are struggling knowing exactly what to focus on since there is too much stuff. Well, that informs professional development for us. So one of the professional developments that we just had recently on our last PSD day was actually walking through uh, a lesson and looking at how you use the components. And so that was designed to actually help people to understand how do I streamline all the pieces. Um, another uh, individual said it, it developing the lessons, finding the various resources online. It takes a long time to find them. So recently we developed an FAQ document and uh, we have found the questions that we've gotten over and over um, that need clarity or people don't know how to find things that we now have one document they can go to and uh, things are hyperlinked for ease of use uh, for teachers. Um, we've gotten a lot of comments around the rigor of the standards. Um, and so what you can see on the screen um, is, you know, they talk about the work in the kindergarten units is very academic and requires background knowledge that our students often don't have. The grade level texts are too difficult for my class of struggling readers. And so really, we know that we still have some work to unpack the complexity of the standards, whether it's a kindergarten class or a fifth grade class, so to really understand what the, the standards demand, because we know that uh, we have to do the kindergarten standards so that our students can be successful in first grade, so then they can be successful in second grade, and so that we have to make sure that we're teaching the rigor of the standards at every grade level. Um, we definitely um, saw some things that fell under professional learning. Um, and so learning the what they're calling the vocabulary for the reading concepts. So maybe um, different parts of the lesson are labeled different than what they've used in the past. And so part of that is part of our, how do we structure professional learning up front to make sure that everybody feels comfortable? Um, another person talks about the lack of time for responsive or small group instruction. Um, and, and part of that is professional learning. Again, understanding how to take the lesson and understand which part is whole group and which part is small group and how they dovetail together. Um, and how that, although we say that we want you to teach the program with integrity, it's not that you're just reading it through without making informed instructional decisions based on the data you have about your students. Um, some of them fell under what I would just call limitations of a pilot. So really understanding that we don't have all the resources in print. We do have a limited uh, spending authority. Um, so we didn't purchase all the writing mentor text. Uh, a minute ago, I told you we didn't buy level text for every single classroom. Um, the limitation of how it is learning it while teaching. So absolutely, uh, it's a new program. People are still learning it. Um, it takes a while to learn a new program, learn new stories. All of those things are very valid. Um, right now, there's no examples of what a final writing project would look like. But what's really interesting is based on some of that feedback, we have started to collect those so that we can share them out. So we're actually um, creating um, a, a place to inventory different grade levels, different types of text writing um, that can then be used as models as we continue to move forward with the pilot. Um, Oh, and a minute ago, I did talk about fidelity versus integrity of implementation. So we don't expect people to um, not um, make instructional decisions based on the students sitting in front of you. In fact, the reason you do an implementation pilot is we've already told you this is a quality product. It's been rated well by several outside uh, sources, um, independently reviewed. Uh, we know all that it was uh, then reviewed by our group of stakeholders. We know it's a quality product, but what we do know is that it's context specific, 
And so the purpose of an implementation pilot is really to think about the context that we're implementing it in. And so, uh, for example, uh, one of the um, comments we received is there's too much talking at the students and sitting still while a beginning kindergartner needs movement. And so we really want to encourage teachers, you have a whole bunch of evidence based best practices that you know. You should be using that in conjunction with the material in the curriculum. And then finally, because I really do want to get to our panel, um, things that um, we, fell, we felt fell within the purview of my view literacy. Um, so one of the things that came up was around the objectives, that they're not student friendly. They're not how we have um, written uh, objectives within our district where it tells the what, the how, and the why. Um, and so that's a, a program specific piece of my view. We certainly can do professional learning around it, but that is how they are written in the text. Um, they also talk about the writing mentor text. Again, we did not purchase those with our limited spending authority, um, but they're saying now I have to find other texts because they're not available. So that's that is a my view literacy concern. So we take all this feedback, we sift through it, and then we really say, how do we act on this feedback? What needs to happen based on it? So that's just um, a few examples. I certainly could talk more, but I think you're going to want to hear from the teachers and the principals that are actually implementing it. Kim, can you go to the next slide? So I'm going to ask if my ELA team could turn their cameras off because I want to make sure that our school friends can turn theirs on. Um, and I wanted to share for board members, um, these are the prompts that I sent to the schools. Um, I told them to um, be their full selves and share their full experience. I asked them to tell you and us the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and I wanted you to hear from the experts in classrooms exactly um, how this has gone. So just give you a minute to see. Um, we gave them several different questions to consider to help them guide their feedback, but I also shared with them I didn't want them to be limited. I wanted them to um, feel that they had the agency to share the most authentic experience that they're having with this pilot. So joining us today, we have a team from Honeygo Elementary School led by Principal uh, Kevin Harrington. He's joined by um, one of his teachers and a reading specialist. We also have a team here today from Scott's Branch led by Principal Lauren Tillman, um, who I think also brought her reading specialist and a teacher with her. Uh, we have Principal Kelly O'Connell here from Mars Estates, who has a teacher joining Kelly today. Thank you so much, Mars Estates. And then we have have a team from West Towson with Principal Jason Barnett also bringing his reading specialist and a teacher. So we tried to go all around the Beltway um, and have a varied experience from different parts of our BCPS community. So principals, teachers, reading specialists, thank you so much for being here. Um, the floor is yours. Please choose any prompt you want to respond to and please share your experience with our board members today. We will start. Mars Estates will um, will begin. Um, so here at Mars Estates, um, last year we piloted the curriculum in K through three um, in the spring, and this year we added fourth and fifth grade to our pilot. Um, something that we have found is that the texts are um, definitely culturally responsive. Um, our students, particularly our students um, who are not white um, are seeing themselves in, in stories um, really consistently for the first time um, in any curriculum that I've used for the last 21 years that I've been an educator here in Baltimore County. Um, the kids are really excited about the text. Uh, the text selections are um, really interesting for the students. Um, Teacher P was just sharing an experience with me while we were um, sitting here listening, and I'm going to um, ask him to share that experience with all of you. Uh, real life kindergarten experience from today. Yes, yeah, so I am a kindergarten teacher here at Mars Estates, and we just read our story on the move, and it's about migration, and there's different images of maps, and lots of robust vocabulary, which is another reason I really like my view. Um, one of the vocabulary words was migration, and we were out at recess just playing on the playground, and one of my students goes, look, the bird is migrating, it's moving south. So then I, I was just 
in awe because I knew that would not have come out of his mouth if we would not have read on the move from my view literacy. Um, that was also, let me say, from one day of reading the text. Um, I can only imagine what other connections they're going to make after multiple days of reading this text. Um, it builds backgrounds and then it also provides rich discussions with each other. So someone who may have had an experience with the story before um, can then turn to the, their partner and talk to them. It just provides lots of experience for um, turning and talking. The um, the vocabulary really is um, extremely robust, robust, and the texts are um, high interest. Uh, something else that we love here, all of my teachers in K through five um, love that the kids can annotate right in the text. Um, with um, any other series that we've used before, students can't annotate in the text. Um, when we read articles, when we read, um, you know, in grad school and we're doing work, um, we annotate the text. Um, and it's really awesome that students just as young as kindergarten all the way through fifth grade are taught explicitly how to annotate text um, and given that freedom to actually mark up their books, which is something that we love. Um, something that I think teachers will need support with and that my teachers are, um, that, that we're working to support our teachers through here at Mars Estates is really um, helping teachers realize that curriculum is a resource, right? It is um, the stories and the standards are there. Um, the skills that we must um, include are there, but we also still have to make sure that we are the instructors making the really good choices for the students that are right there in front of us. Um, so lesson planning, it is such a robust curriculum. There's so many resources, more resources than I've ever seen before. Um, so helping teachers make really good instructional decisions is something that we're doing, my leadership team is doing here at Mars Estates. Um, you know, you have to include all the components, but how you're going to do that um, and what resources you're going to choose is something that we're helping our teachers um, learn how to do here at Mars Estates. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Teacher P. I love the migrate story. Uh, okay, who else? Who's next? I'm wondering if we could hear some challenges and how did we respond when we encountered right. some challenges? So I, it's Kevin Harrington from HoneyGo. Hi everyone. So we piloted my view last year and then we went full school this year. Last year we were third through fifth grade. One of the challenges um, that we had was within kindergarten. So kindergarten um, came to us because they felt it was a little bit too rigorous um, for the students. So we met with them, our leadership team, our reading specialist, and we really talked around how to plan for that, how to provide the scaffolding for it. And what happened from there was our kindergarten teachers started to um, see a lot more student progress. One of the areas of concern was the, the writing piece. So we provided PD for our kindergarten teachers on that, and they went right into the classrooms, implemented the professional development within or within the area of writing, and we started to see more and more writing in kindergarten. And now our kindergarten teachers have come to us and said, I'm really starting to like this now. So that was a big success that we had at Honeygo, but it was a challenge at first because the curriculum does, um, it, it meets the level of the standards. So it's a little bit more rigorous. And that was um, an area that we had to provide professional development on, but also to support on. We've had so many successes here at Honeygo because of my view, but that was one instance where there was a little bit of a um, productive struggle in there as well. Thank you, Kevin. How about West House and Melissa? I think you're going to share too. Yeah. Um, we are, we piloted last year in grades one, two, and four. This year we have it in all of our grades and we've really seen some amazing things, but just like everything else, it's teachers getting used to it. So it's, you know, it's a lot of material, just like, you know, we've said in each of the other schools, it's a very robust vocabulary. It's amazing to see and the kids use that vocabulary and it's really neat. 
you know, just like you said in your kindergarten class, they're using that vocabulary. You're seeing it. They're going outside. The other thing that we love is the connection K to five. There are the same things going on in the units from K to five. So if that kindergartner goes to first grade talking about migration, first grade's also learning about animals and each grade is learning on a more in-depth level um, and it's more rigorous throughout the grade. So it's really neat to see and I think it'll be neat as we go through with my view to see these kindergartners when they get to fifth grade looking at all of these grades. So that's really important to us. There's also a reading writing connection that we've never had before um, or we haven't had in a long time. So the kids are reading and writing every day and that reading connects. I mean that writing connects directly to their reading and what they're doing and it's all real life. They can make connections. They're talking about what playground equipment needs to be changed. They're talking about things in their community. It's real life and they can relate to it and it's really important. Um, I think the struggles that we see here again are all of the resources. I go back to we were back mapping a um, unit two with our teachers and we were talking about the word fidelity and we were talking about using the program with fidelity and to a lot of the teachers here that meant using every single piece of the program and the ELA office really has been so supportive to us and they came in and really said to us using this program with fidelity it's a program that is meant to be responsive to students it's meant to be responsive to the students sitting in front of you. Just like Kelly O'Connell said, you need to be responsive and make good choices for your own students. And so I think the teachers kind of took a sigh and they're looking at the program a little bit more. The more they teach it, the more comfortable they are. It's just like anything else. When you first see something, it's overwhelming. Um, but I've had teachers come to me. We have one here um, and really say, OK, I'm starting to figure out where I need to go, what I need to do. And I really have to give a handout to the ELA office every time we have a question, they answer it that day or the next day. It has not taken any longer than that. And I'm able to get that right back to my teachers. And you know, we had trouble with those objectives and there's so many in my view and you know really just saying to the teachers you need to find out how to write it to again be responsive to your students what you're teaching and what they're learning um, so we've really had a positive um, experience so far and the kids are learning so much the rigorous instruction is is really important I can kind of piggyback off of Melissa. My name's Megan Curtis. I teach here at West Towson. I teach third grade and I'm piloting the program this year, but I also taught fourth grade last year and piloted at the end of last year. So I've been able to experience it in two different grades, which has been wonderful. Um, I will agree with what everyone's saying that it can be very overwhelming in the beginning because there are so many materials, but since this is my second year kind of teaching it in a different grade, I feel so much more comfortable. So I feel that I'm becoming aware of what is available for me and I'm able to look at the different pathways and what's relevant for my students and what my students needs are. I really love the connection um, to the students to the real life. So as Mrs. Wax was saying, I just taught unit um, one for grade three and the students learned about the environment the entire unit and how the environment around us affects us and then they were able to apply their knowledge to their real life and how they can change the environment of a playground so they're just very involved and they're excited because they're engaged and it's related to them so i'm really excited to see that and all of the pd that the ela office that has provided has been really helpful um, i specifically liked the training in october that talked about it kind of dug apart each day of the unit of the week and focused on what should be done and how it can all be intertwined together. So I think if we move forward, that would be something great to continue. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm the reading specialist at, um, at Scott's Branch, and I wanted to mention, so I, we piloted in the spring. 
And so I've seen the teachers who piloted in the spring. This, the things that they talked about, what a lot of the teachers, what a lot of everyone's been mentioning is there are so many resources. It's very overwhelming. And how are my students expected to achieve this level of rigor? But then to see those same teachers in the fall, they are not looking for some. They're not just looking for something scripted. They're empowered. Um, they know they have more access to a variety of resources that now they can use to support all learners. Um, and I wanted to also, when you were speak, someone was speaking about the cultural responsiveness. I also wanted to mention um, how impressed I am with the way that they support the ELL learners. Um, and that's been a big struggle. We have a large population of ELL learners at our school and ways to support them has always been a struggle. So the fact that every single lesson provides a variety of strategies that are not only um, beneficial to the student ELL students, but it's supportive for all students um, because they're they're giving more visuals, they're giving more movement, they're providing things in a different way that they may not have known before. So it's providing those best teacher practices. So they're learning from that. And I see the teachers feeling more confident in their teaching. So that's really impressed me um, throughout the curriculum and just seeing the progression of the teachers there using it. And I'm gonna piggyback off of her because I am impressed with their work here at Scott's Branch. And I'm, I'm even more impressed just seeing all these teachers on the screen right now speaking to um, a program that we also really find near and dear to our heart too. Um, if it's one thing we know is our school does have um, the challenge of our achievement gap. I, I don't sit in a space um, with you today pretending that we don't have a huge lift, but a few, the lifts that we expose ourselves to, we're not afraid to discuss. And one of the things that we do here is really fertilize the ground around what cultural responsiveness even is. You know, what does it look like when we have it? And is it outside of just seeing students of color in the pictures or in the story? How relevant is it? So we, we kind of found that there was like an engagement gap, a relevancy gap, especially as it got for the older students. Um, and so some of the things that we were, the feedback we were getting and I was getting and I was observing was that at times, um, some of the content was a little long. That was one of the challenges for our, some of our intermediate stories that they were a little long. And so our students were kind of getting caught up in the comprehension. Um, and so we kind of talked about how we were able to chunk pieces and how we were able to provide different access opportunities for students that have different learning, um, learning needs. So I am just so excited to introduce also, um, not just Natalie, but um, Katie Banizak on here. I want to hear from, from her to our, for our, one of our first grade teachers. So Katie. Hi, so like Ms. Tillman had shared, um, I'm a first grade teacher at Scott's Branch and I do work alongside with Ms. Brewer as well. Um, so like she said, I did pilot um, at the end of last year and actually now seeing with the pilot starting, I started in unit five, um, but with the beginning of this year, we started in unit one and I'm now kind of seeing the unfolding of each unit. Um, I'm seeing how it builds upon another. So starting at unit five was a challenge. I mean, um, the children that I had in my class last year, they weren't exactly there yet. However, now that I'm starting at unit one, I'm building from day one. Um, I've definitely seen success and improvement with just comprehension, just with writing. And I know some of the challenges that did come up was writing. And I definitely think from day one, the writing was a challenge. Um, but from now, I have seen growth. I've seen my students really build a stamina. And at first, the day one, we didn't have that stamina. But each day that we've added, we've added the stamina, we've built on to our writing and even teaching the language conventions. There's the lessons there for it. Um, I'm getting to go through each of the components and I'm seeing that within their writing, which is super exciting to see. Um, and I definitely think just like how other teachers have shared and other um, resources, resource staff, the texts are engaging, they're relatable, they're so fun, they're colorful, just like seeing like the children engage with them and see and look at them. Um, each of the units, I guess, like they work upon um, one question and I even, Ms. Brewer and I chatted with a student yesterday and 
we say the question every day. We work on the weekly question. Um, we build upon it each week. And Ms. Brewer had a student and she was the student even repeated back the question. And hearing that like makes me so excited to see that they're remembering how plants grow and change. And I can say that each day and then we build upon that question then to go into that project based inquiry um, lessons, which is super exciting for them to see. If we could hear from anyone who hasn't yet shared, I just want to be mindful of our time because I want to make sure our board members have time to ask you questions. Uh, we appreciate, you know, your um, authenticity and um, I want to make sure we have time for that. So go ahead. Hi, I'm okay. Jason Barnett from West Towson. Um, I just wanted to share really quickly. So one of the challenges that we faced here at West Towson was um, teacher time. So just really trying to find the time to fit everything in and also just feeling overwhelmed with the amount of time that they have to plan using all of those resources. So we have found we've just had to be very thoughtful about using our grade level meeting time and some of our faculty meeting time to provide teachers structured planning. Um, looking at the resources, uh, Ms. Wax reference uh, back mapping and planning of for unit two was really helpful for our staff, but we really found that some of our teachers were struggling really early on fitting everything in. And as we work through and and work through the professional developments from Baltimore County um, in the ELA office, working with the MyView representatives, we were we were fortunate enough to host one of the uh, demonstration lessons recently and then just also working with our staff through our um, grade level meetings it's been extremely helpful so we were able to battle that one of the other things that i will echo that other people have shared is i was in fourth grade today i'm um, observing a lesson and just looking at the integration between what they're reading and what they're writing and today we were i had an opportunity to see students talking about uh, travel um, in their lesson, they were comparing a couple of different places um, that they would potentially go. So they were talking about Iceland, Paris, um, Aspen, Colorado, Costa Rica. There was just a variety of places that they were discussing and students were comparing and contrasting those two places and deciding on which one they were they would like to visit. And as they were wrapping up the lesson, the teacher was talking about the travel brochure that they will create later using that information and that reflection. And so not only are we, are we having very rich discussions in class, we are also then seeing that immediately translate into the writing that their students are doing and it is directly connected. And for me, it's fantastic because as a principal, teachers can fill my mailbox with student artifacts every week and I get to read all this fantastic writing and come into the classroom and see all that work happening. So thank you for the opportunity to share today. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you so much. Um, Mr. Offerman, we had um, our understanding was the meeting went till 3.30 and so we wanted to save time for board members to ask questions either of my team or any of our incredible experts that are here today. Um, but I do especially want to thank all of you. I know there are kids in your building right now. You made a lot of efforts to be here because this is so important and I'm really grateful to all of you for your honesty, for your feedback, um, for giving us that growth and certainly Mr. Offerman and Dr. McComas want to turn it back to any board members that have questions for us or anything else that you'd like to discuss. Thank you for the time. Yes, uh, well, thank you all and you, you, you all did a great job, particularly on such short notice. I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, Ms. Hannah had to leave. I wasn't aware of that or I would let her ask her questions earlier. Uh, Ms. Stolosky, I see you, you have a question. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you everybody for um, taking the time to help us understand the program better. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so I know that it was mentioned there's a variety of materials to support teachers with a particular lesson. So whether it's for like that on the move migration story or any other story, it would be helpful to have just a feel for what types of materials are either provided by the program and or like suggested. So if it's an on the move, maybe a suggested activity is to go outside and look for birds migrating, you know, just either like physical resources or suggested classroom activities. Thank you. So teachers, do one of you want to just describe a little bit about some of the teacher resources and then certainly someone from my office can chime in as well. 
I can speak to the teacher resources that are available with the program, if that's okay. That'd be great. Thank My name is Jamie Metzger and I teach fifth grade at Honeywell Elementary School. Um, and I had the opportunity to pilot the program last year and then again this year. Um, one of the things that I find the most beneficial with this program are the access to the teacher resources. We have so many opportunities for assessment beyond just the end of unit assessment that comes at the end of each unit that students are provided. Um, which directly aligns to what students are learning throughout the unit. That's the major component for assessment and resource. However, there are language and assessment handbooks that we can utilize for students throughout the entire course of the unit within the weeks. There are also additional resources that are embedded within the program, which um, include various leveled readers. There are opportunities within the program that involve different um, genres of text that students can access at varying levels. Um, and then students have direct access all the time to the curriculum directly at their fingertips. And one of the things that wasn't spoken about that I think is so important to mention, and it kind of goes off the cuff here, is the parent access as well. Because as a teacher, as a parent myself, I'm constantly wondering how I can best support my students, my children, my own learners at home. And having just finished up our, um, our conferences, one of the questions I continually get from parents is, how can I help? What can I do? So during my conference time, I took the opportunity to show a lot of my parents exactly how to access Savvis online and show them how the weeks are broken down so that they can see exactly what stories our students are reading, what are the um, skills and concepts that are being assessed each week, the writing connection, the vocabulary connection, the grammar and conventions connection as well. And along with those are also practice opportunities for students that we can then customize and individualize for our students that we can also push out for parents to help their students with at home if needed. So that's just an extra little bonus piece of this curriculum that we have never had, which is so beneficial for me as a teacher, trying to offer suggestions for my parents, particularly in conferences of how they can best support their students at home. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lasky, I'm going to move to Mrs. Sine yeah. if that's OK, because yeah. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to, to ask questions. Mrs. Sine? Thank you. First of all, thank you everyone who came and participated in this presentation, sharing your experiences with the MyView pilot. It's awesome to see what it looks like in the real world. And I always say that um, we, we can tell our own success when we see what it looks like on the streets, on the floor. Um, so thank you guys for sharing that. I know for me personally, as a student, being able to you know see curriculum that represents our students is exactly why we are here. It's exactly why we always work so hard to make sure that our students can connect with what they're reading and, and being able to hear that they're connecting their reading and writing skills, making sure that you know they are hitting all of those skill sets and seeing the data and the stories is absolutely my favorite thing. So thank you everyone for sharing some of that perspective. It was awesome to hear as a student. Um, so my question is, um, so what are some things, I guess, that, so we talked about, you know, some some drawbacks with my view and how we've gone around those and how we've improved it and molded it to our own standards in our classrooms. So how can we, you know, if, if this does become something that the board decides to move forward and, and invest in as more than just a pilot, what is some advice you would give to other teachers when teaching this curriculum and, and growing with it? Because of course there is a learning curve, but how would you, I guess, like what advice would you give to mitigate that learning curve and make sure that we are investing in this curriculum to its, like to the best of our abilities? I think personally, I think using just that it is a learning curve and taking that into consideration. I really do think like giving a teacher grace, like feeling your like understanding that there is going to be grace for a teacher and there's going to be grace for your students. They're taking the time, they're learning this new information, they're learning the structures, they're learning the routines while teachers are doing the same thing at the same time. So I think really taking that grace and as a teacher, I've really been hard on myself where I look at the weekly data and I'm like, oh my goodness, oh, this isn't so great right now, but I can take that data and then I can go into the next week and use it um, and adjust like some of my instructional 
routines and expectations and then take it into the next week and kind of just seeing the growth within each of the weeks where maybe one week it's not so much as growth it's more of hey we need to go back and kind of look at this again but it's just using that like information which I feel like my view does give you um, with the weekly assessments and with conversations with students um, but again just like having that grace I think for being an instructor and being like a resource staff, just having the grace for teachers as well. Um, but I think I would take that. Thank you. Thank you very much. M I can speak uh, too as a reading specialist. Um, I feel that I have really leaned on the ELA office. Um, Treasurer Zimmerman has been assigned to our school. She has helped, you know, daily. We email questions, answers. We um, really have dug into all of the lesson components. As you can see behind me, we have um, a theme board for the whole school. So you can see unit two and every grade level is a central question. Um, I have offered weekly, daily check-ins, whatever teachers need um, to help plan the week, the unit, we've back mapped the whole unit. Now they're really starting to see each layer of the five day um, routine, the five lesson routine. And I think so just taking advantage of the PD offered and the support that can be provided within your own schoolhouse um, from other teachers and the reading specialist, because you know we really have dug in to try to find um, as many ways to help teachers as possible and through the experience that we have and um, knowledge of the new series, then we're a good asset to help. Okay, uh, and uh, we're gonna move on to Ms. Causey's questions. Please, Ms. Causey. Good afternoon, and I really appreciate everyone, um, all of the hard work that you're doing in being a part of the pilot in the spring and then also this fall and then taking the time out to uh, come and speak with us today. It's very helpful. Um, I did have some questions related to um, the process um, and also the resources that you're speaking to. Um, how much of the resources are digital and how many of the resources are uh, in paper, both for the teachers and also for the students. I'll start, but then I'll invite my school uh, friends to join in. So um, the, as the teachers, I think it was Kelly O'Connell mentioned, uh, every student has a print consumable book, which also has all of the stories that they annotate on and teachers have print materials. And then there's a parallel access to it digitally. Um, so every student has print and digital access to all of those resources. Um, teachers, I don't know if there are specific instructional resources that you prefer digitally or print. I know that you can access some of the print resources digitally as well um, because I've seen some teachers print them. But um, Ms. Causey, if you're asking about the student and teacher experience, all of our students have that consumable, which is the anthology piece that they actually can annotate as well as having the anchor charts. Um, within the student book that teachers use, um, but then I invite my teacher reading special and principal colleagues if there's anything else you want to add to that. There are, there are so many resources <laughs> um, there really um, anything you could need. I feel like and then more and then I find new ones each day and I find some that my teachers find and share with each other. So they're great resources with that. But yeah, the students all have consumables with the actual text and so do the teachers and that's all digital. But then there's a plethora of additional resources. So there are fluency reads and reteaches and my view readers, which are smaller texts and um, those are digital. Some of the teachers print them out when they want them in print because um, it's for a small group lesson. There are small group lesson ideas. Um, I can't even begin to go into all the resources because there are just so many, but all of the things that are digital can be printed, but the materials the students need in their hand, they have in their hand. We have the reading routines companion. That's in paper, um, which really goes through the explicit instruction of each routine. Um, teachers, paraeducators, um, special educators, new teachers. This is amazing because it gives them the language and that gradual release model so that they do have a paper copy of that. Um, we have cold reads, which for every lesson you can um, 
have a developing on level or extended level text that matches that week's skill. Um, so that is a paper copy. So we do have intervention resources that are also paper copies that teachers don't have to go online to find the access to. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Um, and it was mentioned that uh, my view uh, has met a designation on ed reports. And I'm curious what is the um, importance of that, the relevance of that, um, because we do have other products that we use. I believe it's the Fontes and Pinnell that has a does not meet on ed report, um, but we're also spending. Uh, we have a contract authority on of 11 million for that, so I'm just trying to understand what the designation is and are there. There were also other. Um, sure, I can designations I can that, that were listed. Yeah, I can address that, Ms. Kazi. So the legislation that I referenced in Comar um, was beginning September 1st of 2020 that schools must purchase curriculum that is evidence based using one of these external third party. And so the Fontes and Pinnell that you referenced was purchased prior to that being an expectation and actually prior to there even being such a source as Ed reports to verify when that was purchased. Um, also, I will say that we are not in an ongoing state of continuing to spend money on Fontes and Pinnell. It was purchased at a time uh, for a specific reason, but again, as we've referenced, uh, when you know more um, you and you know better, you do better. And so it still does have a purpose, um, but the reason why, so in other words, if we were to buy a new purchase with Fontes Pinnell now to try to be our core series, we would not be able to, to, to reference why there would be that difference. Um, but I also want to reference, while there is a spending authority, we made an initial purchase, um, probably five to six years ago, and we are not actively um, purchasing those Fontes of Pinnell materials at this point. Okay, thank you. And sure. um, the other um, issue is, uh, I'm curious with this product, it's relatively new is my understanding, and what other uh, school districts have been implementing it for um, a longer amount of time uh, and what have their results been? How is that available to re um, review and understand? Yes, so um, I'll invite Ms. Kraft to talk about some of them, but I will also reference, and I can have Dr. McComas resend it, Ms. Kazi. We did in a board update last June, send a link specifically to graphs of other districts across multiple states that has actually their specific data from using this product. Um, so I can get that link again for you. I don't have that in front of me, but we did include that in a board update that we provided in June, where we referenced several other districts um, across multiple states that had results and specifically identified um, that growth. Uh, this particular version that we are piloting was published in 2020. Um, Ms. Kraft, I know there was one in Ohio. I, I don't Texas, have it in front of me. Pennsylvania, okay. uh, North Carolina, um, and I would love to reshare that graph because they use state data, so it wasn't data collected by uh, Savis, the company, right. but they actually drilled it down to the districts that were using it in their state uh, test, like we have the MCAP, right, but for whatever state um, assessment they have. Um, so there is some really what we would call promising data uh, with states that have implemented it. In addition, uh, just recently we uh, worked with the um, company and we're going to go visit one of the districts in Pennsylvania and one of the districts in New York um, because we think it is important to learn from people that have been doing it longer than we have. So these are districts that have been doing it two or more years. Um, and so they um, have been willing enough to say that we can come into their district and see um, what they're doing, how they've structured it, like basically talk to their teachers without them being present, like, you know, to get the, the you know, the real deal, right? Like what's happening, how has implementation gone? And so, um, like Ms. Shea said, we will give you the data that we had from, um, we had collected previously for the districts that have been using it, um, knowing that it is still a new product, right? So you're only going to have, you know, two years of data, um, but that it does show some promising results. If I Thank could just you. add, I recently uh, went to visit my niece and nephew in Florida and uh, my brother's a single dad and his sister is a principal. And here I am, of course, like assessing my niece and nephew who I don't see that often. And I see on the counter a My View uh, student book, a text. And I, of course, start grilling my fourth grade nephew all about it. And then it was his birthday. So we had um, 
a big birthday party. So I had all these little fourth grade boys there. So I um, did a little research with them to find out, um, you know, what it looks like there. And he is in a, in a top performing district in um, Florida, St. John's County. And um, they've been using it for several years. So it was just really interesting. I didn't know that was going to happen, right? It just happened to be out because my brother isn't that orderly um, and didn't put it back in the backpack. Um, but I was able to get some like kind of firsthand experience about um, how that's working. And it for my own niece and nephew um, who, you know, live in a household where my brother, he reads to them sometimes, but it's not, you know, as you know, every it's not all academic there. Um, you know, he, they've they've done very, very well. Um, so it was, it was kind of a cool experience to see that in real life when I was down there recently. Thanks for sharing. That's a, a nice uh, real life opportunity falling into your lap for a, uh, a focus group. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> OK, at this point, Ms. Cos, I'd like to make sure that that uh, Mr. McMillian gets his questions in. Mr. McMillian. Great. Thanks, Mr. Offerman. Now, I have four questions and please understand I did not construct these questions. I'm asking them for a board member that could not attend. Uh, what, Ms. Shea, they're probably directed towards you more than anybody else. Uh, what right. mechanisms are available to teachers to provide anonymous feedback? That's a great question. So um, the surveys that had been launched um, did ask because it was a Microsoft tool. When you log in, it um, does have your name and email, but we also recently got that feedback that there was a concern that teachers might be afraid to speak honestly, although I will offer that having read the feedback, I don't think there is such a fear of people <laughs> being honest. Um, but anyway, we've offered to relaunch a link with that setting changed so that it can be anonymous. Thank you. Yep. Uh, what were the sizes of the groups that eliminated the other top two curriculums from contention? The sizes of the groups that eliminated the other top. You mean when we had three that we put in front of the stakeholder groups before we moved one forward for the pilot? That's my understanding of this question. So that um, the synthesis of the score point would have been completed by the office in terms of those um, points. So I don't think there was a fourth stakeholder committee, but Ms. Kraft can correct me. So I would say if I had to put a number, it probably was eight to 10 individuals that looked at that, but Ms. Kraft, you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong. So when I just want to make sure just because I, I don't want to give inaccurate information. So are you asking after we had the um, presentations from the vendors, then how did we at that size there? Yes, that's, that's my understanding. That's my so that's interpretation of the question. The okay, I just want to make sure because I want to make sure. So um, I would say I, I have to look at the list, but there were at least eight um, individuals involved in that, but it might have been 10. Um, I, I, I can get back to you with an exact number, but it was that's a okay. minimum of eight. And is this process documented, this review process documented anywhere? Yes, sir. Yes. We have to now keep a um, we have a OneNote document that we keep for all of the materials that go through the 6002 process. OK, and the last question, what is the backup plan? Should they receive negative feedback on my view? So remember, negative feedback means that we go out and support. So it's really important that we understand that negative feedback means we go and support. So um, if the question is, what do we do if we don't get a contract, then we would have to, as we mentioned before, spend $2 million to maintain the not evidence-based curriculum for another year and restart that process from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for answering these questions. Thank you. I just want to note, I answered four questions in about four minutes, Mr. McMillian, so that Mr. Offerman could keep his agenda okay. on time. So. Thank well, you. I really, I, 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 I certainly appreciate that. Uh, my only question or concern is about how much this will cost us in the long run, assuming it goes system wide. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you, you talked about money that we would be essentially, I guess the word isn't wasting is appropriate, but the word, you know, in terms of that. And I was just going to, I just sort of would like to have some kind of a feeling for, uh, for, 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 for what this is going to cost us. If, if 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 it goes system wide, all, you know, all the way through, can you address that at all? Sure. So, um, Dr. McComas, would you like me to address it, or do you want to speak to? Okay. So, um, 
Um, and Miss Craft can help me with the numbers. The, the one caveat is that um, I can share with you that the original contract that we bought forward was for $10 million for six years. Miss Craft, please nod your head if I'm correct, but I believe it was for all six grade levels, K through five for a six year contract. And that would include all of the print materials for a five year contract, excuse me. But that would include all the student materials and then the consumable replenishment every single year. So the students that for are writing their books, Student. We yep. would buy those again every single year for the students, as well as all the teacher materials, the digital access for students and families and for teachers. Um, so that was the original ask. Now, the caveat that I offer is that we know, of course, we have a larger fiscal considerations around the budget. So that pricing is dependent upon um, six grade levels happening at once because oftentimes publishers work that into their pricing quotes. So I just offer that because if we were to separate and do it in a multi-year rollout, which may be fiscally the, the best plan forward, sometimes that would change the lifetime cost of the contract because the pricing uh, quotes could be different as a result. But that's what it was when we got the quote back in June, um, looking at K through five for a five-year contract for print and digital. Ms. Craft, and I you just, want to add anything? I and just wanted to add just, to, just one thing, which is the consumables, once we make that purchase, the consumables come to us each of those years for five years. I'm not paying an additional price each year. Right. And it also includes, I should say, because I know this is often asked, uh, professional development for it those does. five years as well for teachers. Well, thank you so much. And again, thanks to everyone who presented and everyone who, who in fact joined this meeting. Uh, very informative and you know, this is an area that's very, you know, very focused and it's high, high area focus and we need to have success in this area if we're going to move forward. Uh, I do want to make a general statement. I've been on this committee uh, about about three years now and it has certainly been the highlight or one of the highlights of my experience. So Dr. McComas and everyone else who's been involved in these years, thank you. Uh, obviously with the with the uh, with the new members coming on December 1st and some other members er after the uh, after the new governor makes his his uh, his choices, this this uh, th this will be a, a a different group. But but I'm sure you know it'll it, it will continue to do uh, an awful lot for for those people, not only on the committee but for the county to understand what's uh, what is uh, what is going on. And again, uh, th thank you all. Thank uh, you, Mr. McMillian. Oh, Mr. Offerman, I was going to tell you, Mr. McMillian put in the chat that he had a question. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Mr. Milling, you want one more? Go ahead. Oh, no, it was. I'm sorry, it's Roa. That's oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Is there any further business at this time? I just have a quick question. So, this presentation is outstanding, and I want to make sure that absolutely everyone, including new board members, have the opportunity right. to see this this presentation and you know see what my view really looks like. I know that they may not have the full in-depth view of my view quite yet. So is it possible to bring this to the full board for, you know, at least the December 6th meeting? Do you need a motion for that? Can we I do that maybe? I think, well, the first, I, if I may, Mr. Everman, just I'd like to say thank you for that because our team is is has worked hard and they want to make sure that all of all of our board members are informed fully uh, to make and you know wise decisions for our children and our faculty. Um, I think that's something that I would recommend that you um, send to our board chair and vice chair. That's not really a decision that you would make here because that would need to be put onto the full board agenda. And so that's not something that this subcommittee does uh, that work, but you are welcome to send that uh, directly. I know Mr. McMillian's our, our um, vice chair, um, and I know he can certainly carry that, but I would also say um, I know Ms. Hem was with us, but had was not able to stay the full 90 minutes, but um, that's what you would need to send that as a recommendation for consideration of a full board agenda. That's not an action that this committee could take. And, and I might add that perhaps it would be wise not to do it at that point because there'll be four, potentially four other members will be joining at some time. My guess is like around February 1st, and I would hate to have them miss this. So that's just sort of a thought that I have to add to that. But you know, you, you go ahead and do that. That's fine. Okay? One, of the, 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Offman. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just going to say, Ms. Hassan, is that um, one of the wonderful things is how our committee meetings are live streamed. You know, they're videotaped and put That's on the true. public archive. And so members are always welcome to go back and look at things, although I know we're all very busy. And for those who may not be with us in future months, I hope you become committed viewers to our curriculum committee uh, streaming. Uh, same bat channel, same bat time. Uh, third Thursday of the month, uh, you know, for 90 minutes. So, uh, so I just offer that, Ms. Hassan, as well, that as new members join the board over the upcoming months, that there's always opportunity to go back and watch this um, conversation uh, as it unfolded today um, and even the previous ones, because this is, I think, our third presentation now, on my view, uh, with the committee if we go back to uh, last spring. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll continue to engage in in uh, dialogue around how our pilot is going, what's best for our students, what's best for our teachers. You, we know in the long run that right now, um, as Ms. Shea said earlier, roughly only one out of every three students is hitting proficiency on the state assessment. One out of three. So we know what we're doing is not getting our students where they need to be. So uh, we'll continue to work together to figure out what is the stronger path forward for our children, because that's what we're here for. So, so thank you and um, thank you everyone. I hope that this was informative. I hope it clarified um, understanding. I hope that it, it provided answers to questions and that we'll continue, we'll continue in that vein. So. Uh, I do want to announce that the next schedule meeting committee is February 23rd at 2 o'clock. And uh, if there's no further business, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Take Thank care and have, uh, have a very nice Thanksgiving, everyone. Likewise. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you for giving us the time. Thank and you, Thank you, Kazi. school friends. You were um, amazing. Thanks, school friends. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.